Hey you, are you wasting your time on social media again? Your brothers and sisters in Islam net from Norway are establishing a masjid, a da'wah center. Establishing a masjid to convey the message of Islam is one of the best deeds a Muslim can do. There's a huge need for it in Norway. You know this and I know this. So that makes the reward even greater. So give generously and Allah Azza wa Jal will give you even more. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? Before we start this video, um, I think many of you will be aware of the fact that in Pakistan now there are severe floods. And as the Muslim community, it's really incumbent and wajib upon us to step in. You know, Pakistan is one of the biggest Muslim countries, mightiest Muslim countries. And a seventh of the population of Pakistan is affected by these severe floods. 1,100 people have already been uh, have, have already died in these floods. So I will say, please, click on the link below and help the individuals and the people in Pakistan. The reason why I'm making this video is because actually it's, came, it's come to my attention after the fact, after I've recorded a video with Ali last week, it came to my attention that there was one incredibly disturbing and alarming thing that I heard, which I think maybe if you if you listen to it as well, coming from a Muslim perspective, will agree is totally Outrageous if understood in the way that it's stated. Let's see what's said. If a woman stepped out on her marriage, the vicious, poisonous, let's throw her out and get a... Uh, he could spit on camera, you know? But in a man's position, as long as we get a paper from the mosque and we cover it up, uh, it's... Uh, she states, if a woman stepped out of her marriage. Now, this phrase stepped out of her marriage i'll be honest with you i thought she meant a divorce and still maintain that she might have meant that if a woman tried try to seek a divorce would try to go for a khula or a fesh or something like that then xyz and then she goes on to compare it with a man being married or getting a paper from the mosque getting married uh, you know you know in a legitimately islamic way getting a paper from the mosque probably with, without the knowledge of his wife. That's my understanding of what's happened. Now, first and foremost, I don't want to go straight for the jugular here because although Merriam-Webster's Dictionary and Cambridge Dictionary, both of them define the term stepping out as being unfaithful, which of course includes sexual uh, infidelity here. It's talking about a woman who's committed adultery versus a man who's married another woman. Although that could be interpreted like this, I will not interpret it like that because there is plausible deniability. I will employ Hosna Van on this occasion. And I will actually persuade and encourage everyone else listening to this to do so. However, because the matter is, has some level of shubha, has some level of ambiguity, I think still it requires a refutation. And moreover, I will say this. Even if she did not, Sister Sumaya did not intend what she said, or what, what I've just described, this comparison we find very widespread among the muslim community a comparison of a polygyny that is done especially if it's done uh, without the first wife's knowledge with full-out adultery which is zina in the context of marriage which as we know both a man and a woman in islam if they commit such an act both a man or a woman this is considered one of the worst worst sins in all of Islam. Now let me attack the notion here. If someone who is a Muslim, who claims to be a Muslim, makes such a comparison and tries to create continuity, moral continuities between the two notions, then they have actually admitted to themselves that there is, there is something immoral in polygyny, even something immoral in polygyny that doesn't require the first wife's permission and or consent. I will say, where is the evidence for that? I will say, where is the evidence for that in Islam? Where is, if one is, if one is predicating, yes, their morality on an Islamic system, I want to know the evidence where such two things can be compared. In fact, to the contrary, you cannot compare something the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did, the Sahaba did, with something like this. And doing so means, has exposed, quite frankly, would expose, yeah? It would t 
totally expose the spiritual bankruptcy that individuals have on this notion. It would expose it. And I'll go further than this. I will say, not only does it expose it, this one mas'ala, this one matter here, could be a window to your entire Islam. What is your evidence for that, Muhammad? The evidence for that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ فَمَا جَزَاءُ مَا يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا خِزْيٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةُ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ أَشَدِّ الْعَذَابِ وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا يَعْمَلُونَ That do you believe in parts of the book and reject other parts of the book? Now I'm not saying this, by the way, just to make it more clear. This is uh, applicable to Sister Somaya. Because once again, there is plausible deniability. But the notion that two things can, like this can be compared is totally is totally incorrect. Now I want to take a step back and talk about something quite important. Individuals, because this has pastoral implications, who are actually going through polygamy and, you know, women particularly who have serious emotions, you know, because it's difficult. It is a jihad in itself. It is a struggle, especially for the first wife. You know, it is very difficult. Anxiety and jealousy and anger and frustration. It is not haram for a woman and I make this very clear, it is not haram for a woman to not like polygamy for herself. The Prophet Muhammad said clearly, that Jannah has been surrounded by hated things, disliked things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, he says, that fighting has been prescribed for you and it is hated for you. And you can hate something which is good for you. So there is nothing un-Islamic, sacrilegious, blaspheming about the fact that a woman doesn't want this for herself. I'm making this candidly clear. It's very important. I mean, most women will not want this for themselves and for good reason. That is within their nature not to like it. Men should not blame them for that. Let me be clear. Men should not blame them for that. Oh, I don't want it. No, no, no. That is within her right and her nature. And in fact, she'll be rewarded if she continues and is resilient and so on. However, the problem lies not in the fact that you hate it for yourself, but that you start to abhor it or find it repugnant in and of itself. Or as a, as a normative practice practiced by certain Muslim practitioners. Let me make this clear by giving, a, giving an analogy. Let me give an analogy of eating meat. Okay, eating meat. In Islam, eating meat is halal. It is not wajib. Just like polygamy is halal and it's not wajib. Okay. Now, somebody can say, I don't want to eat meat because of health, for health reasons and not eat meat, abstain from eating meat. Or in fact, can hate eating meat because of what it does to them physically. Or even feel sickened by eating meat. Maybe they see some animals walking around and they feel sickened at the thought that this animal will be slaughtered and then I'll consume the animal. Therefore, every time they eat a burger or whatever, then they actually feel physically sick. And so they don't eat meat. They don't like meat for themselves. They find it sickening. They don't like it. Now, it's fine for that Muslim to say, I feel sick by eating meat and I don't want to eat meat. But when that Muslim turns around and says, look at those people eating meat, you see now what's going on. Look at those people eating meat. Look at those people eating meat. They are doing something immoral. Look how bad they are. How could they eat them? How could they eat meat? How could they do such a thing? How cruel they are. How barbaric they are. How oppressive they are. Now you have moved into more than just a gray area. Because you have now attributed oppression to something which Allah has allowed. Oppression with something which Allah has allowed. And dhulm in the Arabic language is is putting something in other than its rightful placement. But then Allah he says, eat from whatever you like, from what we have allowed. And he did not make meat haram. So by saying that about those individuals that are eating meat, now you've moved into a major gray area, even more than a gray area. Now you are going into the kufr zone. I'm not saying you have committed kufr or that you are kafir, but you're, you're veering it's a slippery slope. Because the next step after that is saying eating meat is wrong, which is the equivalent here by saying polygamy is wrong, it's immoral, it's unjust, it's oppressive. 
That is kufr akbar yukhrish sahibuhum min al-millah. That is something which is kufr akbar, the kufr, that takes somebody out of the religion of Islam. Because clearly Allah says the opposite. So what I'm saying is that there's a fine line between analogy one, two, and three. Having said this, if we go back now and we talk about why this is so powerful, the idea that this can be seen as oppressive to even Muslim people, men and women, is actually a powerful proposition. Is it because there is a great deal of academic evidence and first principle argumentation from ethics, in ethics and morality, on consequentialist grounds or deontological grounds? No, it's not because of any of that. The reason why this is a powerful argument is simply because men and women, especially first wives, have an emotional theological reaction to the matter and they feel pain. Because they feel pain. Pain is a very powerful thing. Pain is a very powerful thing. And then when you have pain, that pain can then be transferred onto empathetically to other women who put themselves in the position of that particular woman, first wife, who went through that pain. And this in psychology is referred to as uh, emotive contagiousness or something to that effect. So you, you actually become, sorry, empathetic contagiousness. Empathetic contagiousness is the term that Bloom uses in his book. That empathetic contagiousness, that your pain becomes someone else's pain. And then the general argument is, my pain, how could, the, how could such a person allow me to be in pain. Pain is oppression. Basically, pain and oppression are two sides of the same coin. That's the brain of If I'm in pain, then whoever is causing that pain to me is oppressing me. Of course, such an argument is fallacious. It's uh, a fallacious argument strictly from an ethical perspective and unsubstantiated. However, we'll, we'll, we'll say something else. Just because it's a fallacious argument from an academic perspective, it doesn't mean it's, it's, the pain is not real. And once again, we have to acknowledge that women go through a lot of pain. Jealousy, anger, frustration. But just because you're just because it's true that you have pain, it is true that you have pain, it doesn't mean that your pain is the truth. Meaning here, you cannot use your pain to diagnose or otherwise arbitrate what is true and what is false from a from a moral perspective. You have no epistemological or theological right to do so. There's, no, there's actually no argument there. Do you see? And I gave the argument already. I spoke to you in the previous video, which you can watch, about certain double standards from a theological paradigm, which certain uh, first wives uh, who abhor the act or have shown some discontent with it actually employ. But this empathetic contagiousness, although it's not academically robust, it's an emotional argument, it's a flat-out emotional argument, which is filled with fallacy and untruth and is baseless, it is still very powerful. Because quite frankly, the statistical abstractions of the consequentialist arguments for polygamy on a collective, uh, le collectivist level is something which people can't empathize with. You cannot, as P Bloom said, you cannot empathize with statistical abstractions. In other words, if I tell you there's, for example, some consequentialist arguments or arguments about consequences. If I say to you, uh, polygamy solves this problem, this societal problem, which one, for example, it, uh, it increases the Muslims in the, in the world, which for us is an object of sharia. The Prophet ﷺ told us to do that. For example, if someone, it, it, polygamy solves another issue, which, which issue is this? Uh, single mothers or divorcees who need to get married and find it difficult on the marriage market for many years, five years, ten years, then they finally find somebody through polygamy, which they would otherwise not have found. So it solves, you have a surplus of women that now, it solves an issue here. It puts more people in psychological, if you put a utilitarian basis, uh, state of stability. In fact, there was, an, uh, there was actually a study that was conducted on 56 uh, tribes, Villages, sorry, 56 villages. I think it is the only one of its kind. Oh, and this, this was a study that was done in the Western academic setting. 
And in that study, they concluded that there is no harm in polygamy from that perspective. And in fact, they mention stock argumentation for some of the advantages from a collectivist paradigm. They say, for example, the economic resources are spread. Uh, it increases um, education, obviously, because if economic, if economic resources are spread, then education within uh, certain families are spread and so on. So these arguments that I'm putting forward to you now, which are collectivistically consequential in nature, are cold rationalization you can't empathize with them so even though on this basis you can make an argument it's not going to compete for certain people who have had emotional theological reactions with the bitter pain of the emotional argument even though it's a fallacious argument what is the argument the argument is uh, i feel pain therefore it's oppressive which is false it's a wrong yani how do you prove how do you jump from a to b yani the point is so that's the first thing I was saying. So th this is very important. The second thing is to do with this, the, the point of disclosure, because they mentioned it many times in their video, and I didn't mention it, didn't talk about it. Now, in the religion of Islam, the religion of Islam does not encourage that you always have full disclosure with your partner. In fact, there's a hadith, and quite frankly, I'm saying it reluctantly because some people may misuse it. Some of us may misuse it, especially young people like me, will misuse it, yes? But the hadith which says, لا يحل الكذب إلا في ثلاث That lying is not allowed except in three circumstances. And one of the circumstances is hadith الرجل امرأته And to be fair, the hadith also says, hadith المرأة لزوجها أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم That if a, if a husband speaks to his wife or if his wife speaks to to her husband. The religion of Islam does not encourage full disclosure when it comes to marital affairs. Why? Because there are some things which the in romantic relationships are, if uh, explained, it can cause some serious detriment to the marriage. And even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did this himself. Not that he lied, but he kept things secret. And this is in the Quran. وَإِذْ أَصَرَّ النَّبِيُّ إِلَى بَعْضِ أَزْوَاجِهِ حَدِيثًا فَلَمَّا نَبَّأَتْ بِهِ this is in the Quran. That when the Prophet Sallallahu Allah, uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu kept something from some of his wives. He told some of his wives not to tell the other ones. So this whole discourse, which was quite prominent, about no, uh, it's, you have to be completely open and honest and so on. This is actually not substantiated with the text. There are some things in a marital situation from the Islam perspective which should not be disclosed. Full disclosure is not the Islamic position. Clearly not. So this idea is why doesn't he come and speak to her this and that? Especially, let me make a prediction for you. If, as we're seeing, because a lot of these matters are actually interconnected. There's a flesh that joins all of this stuff. In the Western context, for example, we're seeing, and I've mentioned this in previous podcasts, we're seeing, for example, men's children be taken away from him and weaponized at the expense of the children's well-being, their educational health, their physical health, their psychological health, and the man. Yes, and even the extended family of that man, which includes women, by the way, for, his, for example, the man's mother, etc. So when a dispute happens in a marriage, or that the woman will say to the man, I threaten you with the kids. Or if you do this, you're not going to see your kids again. So in this situation, if the man, if you put him in this position and he gets married without your knowledge, then you have given him some reasonable basis to do so, quite frankly. You have given him a reasonable, you have given him a reasonable basis to do so. Because you're simply saying, if you, I'm going to reward your honesty with destruction. How do you expect, quite frankly, a man to respond to such a situation who let's say is physiologically inclined towards the polygynous option now if you're a fool quite frankly if you're a fool then you would say such a thing because now you're basically giving him justification not to disclose certain facts if you're not a fool and you handle the matter with maturity then surely the man uh, will maybe honest with you maybe have full disclosure and speak to you about all these matters this so i predict so long as we see runaway fathers, which I've already expressed my disdain for, by the way, 
runaway fathers and mothers who weaponize their children continue to proliferate in our societies and acquiescence to such figures, we will see more secret marriages, or let's not call them secret marriages, marriages where the first wife does not know in society. And they are jurisprudentially possible, by the way. As jurisprudentially possible, as, for example, a, a, a woman who does ishtarat before a marriage, according to the Hanbali Madhab and some other Madhab, which is that she says, before a man gets married, if you do polygamy, then the divorce will take place. It's mentioned in Al-Mughni, but Ibn Qadama, many people mention at this point. i give you references for that. So in other words, if a woman says, I, I insist on monogamy, and according to the Hanbali Madhab, they accept. But other Madhab, no. Uh, since we're so, since we're being jurisprudentially open, so other madhab say no. Ayu shartun laysa fi kitab illahi. For a batil, they bring the hadith, and they say any condition that is not within the book of Allah, then it's already nullified. And this is the majority opinion. Okay. So with this, I feel like what is being encouraged here with the attack on fatwas, the attack on uh, religion and so on, uh, polygyny and so on, an indirect attack. I'm not saying necessarily with the tea talk sisters, but generally in the Muslim sphere, especially in the Western world, with the influence of feminism, is a culture of jurisprudential censoriousness. A gag culture of jurisprudential censoriousness, where men will feel like they, their only option is X, Y, and Z, and women don't know also their options, that they can do shirat before the marriage and so on. And I want to say this, you know, if we do, instead of thinking about the matter, with a solid morality which is anchored in the Qur'an and Sunnah and in the jurisprudential tradition, but instead opt to deal with the matter in a way which is just based on our desires, then we would be falling into exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted in Surah Al-Mu'minun. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا اتَّبَعَ الْحَقُّ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ لَفَسَدَةِ السَّمَوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ مَنْ فِيهِنْ in chapter 23, verse number 71, that had the truth followed their desires, everything in the universe would have been completely corrupt. The universe, the heavens and the earth and everything within them would have been corrupt. Meaning what? Meaning that there is a very delicate and sophisticated system through which the universe operates. A very delicate, a delicate and sophisticated system, call it the fine-tuning, call it whatever you like. That It's a Goldilocks zone of perfect numbers. Everything is, if it wasn't like this, then the universe wouldn't be a certain way. Now, the same thing applies, the phone that I'm using, the microphone that I'm using, the screen that you're watching me with right now. All of that is based on hard geo geometry and mathematics. It's not based on your volatile emotions. When you go on a plane, it's not based on your volatile emotions. The systems on the plane, the engine on the plane, the, the, the design of the architecture of the plane is not based on emotions. It's based on hard facts. Because your facts, actually, are, uh, are indifferent to your emotions. The facts are indifferent to your emotions, whether you are positive or negative. Which means now, if you decide to let something as volatile as your own emotions be the guide, your moral guide in life, then you, you have a volatile life. You wouldn't allow such a thing to happen on a plane. You wouldn't say, let me based on, I am going to ride a plane that is based on a volatile set of architectural uh, or arbitrary set of haphazard architectural uh, points of reference which means what which means that when you want truth you opt for the truth which is solid you don't opt and organized moreover i want to make the point of cognitive dissonance a lot of our sisters have it's and brothers quite frankly and brothers as well they have started to develop this disdain towards something which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed and by the way we've already mentioned the ayat which talk about and you believe in parts of the book and this believe in other parts and we've also to be fair mentioned those uh, ayat which which reference that you can not like something for yourself but we there's one other set of ayat which we haven't mentioned I'll just give you one example which is that when uh, Surah Muhammad where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that is because they hated what Allah has revealed so Allah has destroyed and nullified all of their deeds if, you, if you've become an individual who went to stage three in the vegan uh, analogy, which is now you're starting to say that the thing is immoral itself, then you're an individual who now enters or oh, you hate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You hate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed and 
you're you are going to have nullified actions. You are going to have nullified actions. Yes. Do you think this is a laughing matter and a joking matter? This is a serious matter. It's not giggle culture. Yeah, this is a serious matter. And, and it creates, even on a psychological level, it creates cognitive dissonance. Because cognitive dissonance is a psychological disorder where you claim to believe in something, but then actually your actions <laughs> show something completely different. So individuals who fall for this kind of prey, fall prey to this kind of thing, they are the least psychologically contented individuals because they suffer from the deepest and most entrenched type of cognitive dissonance which causes an internal struggle within them which leaves them unsettled and anxious to say the least. And one more thing I wanted to say about this whole polygyny issue is about framing, how this whole thing is framed. Now, I, this might sound unusual to a lot of you, but many of you will know in the public discourse we hear things to the effect of a man, a Muslim man, has a right to marry a Christian and Jewish woman. Okay? So it's spoken of what the options, of a, a marital options of a man are spoken of in terms of rights. This is framing now. I'm saying, okay, but a Muslim man cannot marry a Muslim woman. It's never framed. A Muslim man does not have the right to marry a Muslim, married, sorry, a married Muslim woman. Yeah? But it, is never also framed that a Muslim woman has the right to marry a Muslim, a married Muslim man. So the, the whole rights, responsibilities, rights, inhibitions framing is actually unusual. To me, it is skewed. It is biased. It is wrong. Another thing can, that can be said is that, for example, when we talk about uh, we talk rights and responsibilities, when we talk about the issue of polygyny, some, especially non-Muslim detractors, is anti-Islamic detractors, they frame the issue as an issue where men are taking advantage of women. But actually, subsequent wives are also in the framing here. In other words, there needs to be an accomplice. And the accomplice is a subsequent wife. And the subsequent wife is a woman herself. So why is the issue not seen as a woman versus woman issue? Because it is as, as much a woman versus woman issue as it is a man versus woman issue. There is as many or even more women involved in the equation of polygyny as there are women. In other words, more women do polygyny to other women in the equation of Islamic polygyny than men do. Why? Because a man can have two wives, three or four. In the case where he has three, that's two women doing it to one or do, two, two women doing it to two. So how is it an issue of man versus woman? The framing itself is disturbing. Finally, we have already covered in great length the issue of resilience and what is being said to women and you can leave and this and that. One very common thing that happens in polygyny is that a woman will ask or give the man an ultimatum. If you don't, if you don't divorce this person, then goodbye. And the Prophet he said, uh, he clearly said, "Let us al-mar'atu talaq uhtiha." He said, "A woman should not ask for the divorce of her sister." Yani, you should not ask your husband. Give him the ultimatum is haram, and that she will not be given uh, except ma qudira laha, what Allah has done qadar on another way. That she will not be given from the dunya except for Allah has has has, has allowed for her. So you, should try, you cannot manipulate the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Try and take someone else's risk away. This is not right. And this can be done directly and it can be done indirectly. Because some women will not say it directly, oh, you know, go and divorce, I give you an ultimatum. But she'll make the man's life hell and she will indirectly hint at the fact that she wants him to, to divorce. The point being here is, these things are not mentioned in the, in the context of polygyny. These things are not mentioned in the context. And the idea of a woman herself asking for a divorce for no reason. The Prophet said, Any woman who asks for her husband a divorce for no reason, then it's haram for her the fragrance of heaven. These things are not even mentioned by certain sisters that are talking about the rights and responsibilities and issues like polygyny. And that's why it's very dangerous to come and speak about these matters without Islamic knowledge or consultation or a fair representation. 
And that's why this, these kinds of videos are, are required counter, uh, to counter these kinds of other videos. And what I will say is, when you consider the matter clearly, I will finish with what I'm about to say. When you consider the matter clearly, if, and you have to be honest with yourself, if whether you're a man or a woman, but going back to the vegan example, if you're an individual who has started to find disgusting the fact that other men practice this act of polygyny in a normative way, yeah, whether they do it in a way which is jurisprudentially ideal or not, so long as it is halal and it's allowable through an opinion, whether it's misyar or not, because misyar is tanazul an ba'd al-hukuq and it's allowed in Islam. Yes, it is allowed in Islam. Uh, so that bint Zama did this uh, uh, misyar with the problem of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she's not doing 50-50. Such a, such a model is also flexible enough to be allowable in Islam. So whether it's misyar or any type of polygyny, which is acceptable jurisprudentially, if you find yourself looking at such a, a thing, an action, and saying that that is disgusting in my opinion, or I find that people do that are oppressive, then know that you are skating on thin ice, know that you are playing with your iman, and know that the problem is deeper than this mas'ala. This mas'ala, this issue, has just highlighted, highlighted the deeper iman problem crisis that you have. Because the real problem is, maybe, well you have to look at it, the extent to which you actually believe that the man called Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who came in the 7th century, the man who claimed to be a prophet, the extent to which you believe this is actually the case, that is itself now in question. Because it's not just a matter of iman or kufr. There is a range of different iman. Iman goes up and down. Yaqeen is at the highest. Ayn al-yaqeen, ilm al-yaqeen, top level uh, 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 certainty. That's at the top level here. Yes, but you may be wavering at the 50% mark. You may be at the 55%, 60%. This is where the issue is. Because somebody, اقسم بالله العظيم, who believes 100%, 100%, this thing is halal, they will not have a problem with the hukum itself in any way, or the practitioners of it. They will have a problem with it being done to themselves, as we saw with the mothers of the believers, and the greatest women of all time. That's fine. That you're allowed to, this is what is allowed. This is absolutely, no one should be shamed or blamed for any of that. But this is how it is. So if you realize that you have a hole in your iman, you have to go back to the drawing board and read the seerah, read the Quran, do your adhkar. Because when you do things like that, then your iman is raised and this stuff becomes quite easy to believe, to be honest. Very easy to believe. That's all I have to say. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that whoever builds a mosque for Allah, Allah will build for him a similar house in Jannah. And we know the great reward that will not only be gained, but rather will fill your grave after your death. Whenever someone prays there, whenever someone gives shahada in the masjid, whenever someone learns something in the masjid, yes, that will be something that you'll have on your scale.